Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are examining the curse of the Aztec Mummy from 1957. This is the sequel to the Aztec Mummy, and well, not only was it released the same year as that film, but it was also released incredibly soon after. Bear in mind that the, the Aztec Mummy came out on November 13th, so, well, essentially it must have been released uh, less than two months later. We, we don't have an exact date, but that much is certain. Further to this, the Aztec Mummy, uh, the curse of the Aztec Mummy, and um, its sequel, The Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy, which I will admit I'm incredibly excited to watch. I mean, how could I not be really? I mean, that's such a, a stupid but fun concept. I love the idea of a, you know, like a robot fighting an Aztec Mummy. How could I not love that? But anyway, the point is, all three films were shot back to back. And well, I'm sure it's not going to shock anyone that they were shot on the shoestringiest of shoestring budgets. Anyway, in terms of the uh, the format for this episode, it's going to be the same as usual. We shall start by looking at the uh, the history that the film presents, and then I shall simply review the film. But before then, well, as usual, it is time for our dramatic intro. Right, you are an evil scientist gangster who became infamous after you started mismatching animals creating terrifying monsters this however is not that story you have just escaped from jail busted out by your own goons and now you hope to continue your scientific research to do so you will need money and as such you plan on breaking into an aztec tomb to steal a breastplate and bracelet that is there. These items have hieroglyphs on them which lead to Aztec treasure. Even though just a couple of weeks ago you literally watched another scientist named Eduardo and his fiancée Flor go into the pyramid and take these items, and even though by your own admission you know that these items were then put back in the pyramid, you know, the one that you literally watched them take them out of. For some reason and somehow, you've forgotten the location of the pyramid. And well, as such, you kidnap Floor and hypnotize her to bring her back to a past life. In this way, she can take you to the pyramid. However, whilst you undertake this overly convoluted and, well, admittedly completely unnecessary plan, not only do you have to deal with Eduardo, who's coming for his, uh, his fiance, but you also have to combat a luchador superhero named the Angel. You manage to outsmart these two and make it to the pyramid. Here, you find the fabled breastplate and bracelet. However, this is not the end of your troubles. You will now have to face another foe. By taking these items, you have awoken a terrifying monster. Soon, you will have to face the curse of the Aztec Mummy. I, I love that everything I just said actually happens in this film. Like, there's no denying it's, a, it's an insane film. But, well, anyway, we'll get to that. For now, we've arrived at the historical section of the episode. First things first, as I normally say with these Aztec ones, um, please do bear in mind that I'm an Egyptologist, not a Mesoamericanologist. They are very different cultures, and despite what some people may tell you, they didn't interact. That being said, I have done my research, and I will try to keep this as accurate as possible. To be honest, however, this film really doesn't add anything at all, um, like new historically as compared to its predecessor, The Aztec Mummy, and as such, uh, for this section, I'm going to uh, sort of very much uh, use it as a sort of a jumping off point instead. Basically, Sochil in the film was supposed to be one of the wives of the, uh, the god Tezcatlipoca, as such, in this section, we are going to look at, you know, a bit more in depth into this god, how the Aztecs viewed him, his relationship with another god, Quetzalcoatl, 
and how he was viewed by previous cultures named the Toltecs. By doing so, we should be able to figure out a little bit more about his nature. So, before we dive right into our analysis of uh, Tezcatlipoca, it may be best for us to have a little look at the other, at uh, another god, uh, Quetzalcoatl, who in many ways was seen as the opposite of Tezcatlipoca. In the Aztec language, uh, a Quetzal was the name of a local bird that was kind of like widely considered to be the most beautiful type in the area. Meanwhile, uh, Kotl basically means serpent. As such, the name uh, Quetzalcoatl means feathered serpent and, well, as such, he was depicted as a, a bit of a mixture of a bird and a snake. And in fact, it was these two animals that made up the very essence of his, uh, like, dual, like, nature. As a serpent, he was seen as a creator deity associated with uh, vegetation, most notably maize. Partly due to this association, he was also seen as the god of springtime. Meanwhile, as a bird, he represented the wind and the air. However, on top of all of that, he was also seen as the, uh, the morning star, and as such he was associated with light. When it comes to the, uh, the Toltecs, who um, we shall see a little later, they were essentially one of the, uh, the great civilizations before the Aztecs, and likely the civilization in which Quetzalcoatl had his origins. They strongly associated him with kingship, and in fact their kings likely claimed lineage from him. Though, by the same token, it does need to be realised that the majority of sources on the Toltec Empire are Aztec in origin, and well as such they date to at least 150 years later. So, basically but it's hard to separate the, the myth from the actual fact here. But either way, regardless, it is likely that the Toltecs strongly associated Quetzalcoatl with kingship, and as a result of this, the Aztecs did the same. According to the Aztec sources, Quetzalcoatl had given the Toltecs a very large civilization, and, well, as such, he could also give them a large empire as well, you know, give the Aztecs a large empire. So put simply, as a bird, Quetzalcoatl was the god of the wind. As a serpent, he was the god of the earth and vegetation. As the morning star, he was associated with light, and on top of that, he was associated with kingship. Now, moving on to uh, Tezcatlipoca. According to one, like, Aztec creation myth, Tezcatlipoca baited the earth monster from the depth of the sea using his foot. The earth monster ate his foot, but, well, in the struggle, her lower jaw was also ripped clean off. She was, as such, hideously crippled, and was unable to sink back into the depths of the water. Because of this, she floated on the surface, becoming the earth that we now walk on. Tezcatlipoca was, was actually considered to be the most powerful of the earth gods, and ruled over the surface of the earth. On top of this, his name means smoking mirror, which refers to obsidian. So, essentially, obsidian is basically glass that is formed in the incredible heat of volcanoes. It is black and incredibly shiny. As such, in Mesoamerica, it was often used to make mirrors. In Mesoamerican religion, seers would gaze into these mirrors until they fell into a trance. Then, within the black, glossy surface. They would see pictures which they believed would reveal the, uh, the future of their tribe and the will of the gods. Going back to uh, Tezcatlipoca, although black was his main colour, he was actually far more complicated than that. In the east, his colour was yellow in honour of the rising sun and the fruitfulness of the maize plant. The southern Tezcatlipoca was the blue hummingbird. In the west, his colour was red, the colour of blood in sacrifice. In the north, he was associated with black. In this form, he was the spirit of witchcraft and black magic. Another name for him was Teotihuacan, meaning he who is closest to the shoulder. This is because he was thought to be close to every shoulder, 
whispering thoughts into the mind, suggesting violence and trickery. In all of his forms, he was the god of warriors and war. He was a dangerous and deadly being who brought much material gain to his servants, the Aztec people. As such, it's not hard to see how he is uh, the complete contrast of Quetzalcoatl. Where Quetzalcoatl uh, represents light, Tezcatlipoca represented darkness. Where Quetzalcoatl represents uh, divine rights to rule, you know, as, as seen in the kings of the Toltecs, Tezcatlipoca represented might and violence. Now, when looking at it in uh, this regard, especially from a kind of like modern lens, it is easy to assume that, uh, you know, Quetzalcoatl represented what is good and Tezcatlipoca represented um, evil, essentially. However, this is actually not really the case. It, it needs to be realised that these are very subjective terms which change drastically, both with time and also depending on the culture we're looking at. You know, for instance, so what might be considered good in uh, the UK may be different from what was good in China. Different cultures have different interpretations. One's not wrong, one's not right, that's just the way it is. For instance, um, in Mesoamerica, a good person was someone who observed the daily rituals and didn't seek their own pleasure or happiness. Meanwhile, evil was seen as kind of like cowardice, adultery and murder. And you need to bear in mind that um, murder was seen as different from sort of like, uh, you know, people getting killed on the battlefield or sacrifice, for instance. So it isn't exactly the same sort of like... Um, definitions either of, of what um, murder would actually be. And also, even when it comes to these evil acts, um, they were still kind of viewed as being by the design of the gods. So um, although of course the individual committing these acts would be punished, um, very often they'd be put to death, it was also believed that they were fated to commit these acts. As such, um, in many ways, it is kind of always better not to view Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl as a uh, wholly good or evil. Instead, they were basically just two equally necessary but opposite forces. A good way of uh, seeing this all come together is in the fate of the Toltec civilization, or, well, at least um, as told by the Aztecs. So I suppose they're kind of like mythological fall of the, uh, the Toltec people. We've already seen how Quetzalcoatl gave um, the Toltecs a great empire and many great kings. However, their fabled interactions with Tezcatlipoca are, <laughs> well, far different to say the least. As the myth has it, Tezcatlipoca turned himself into a great giant and allowed himself to be slain by the Toltecs. His enormous carcass then lay on the earth and began to rot, bringing about pestilence which, well, in turn, killed many of the Toltecs, you know, via sort of a disease. <laughs> Uh, later, he then tempted the daughter of the High Chief, and, well, he did this by appearing to her in the marketplace as a naked trader, painted half blue and half red. Apparently, his penis was so beautiful that she was overcome by desire. My, my, my. The daughter became pregnant with his child, and in Aztec myth, this child was named Humac, the legendary last king of the Toltecs, who led to the total collapse of the Toltec power. So, in conclusion, Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl are in complete contrast to each other. But in many ways, this is the very core element of many Mesoamerican religions, including, including the Aztecs. Quetzalcoatl represented springtime, winds, the morning star, and divine kingship. Tezcatlipoca represented many things including darkness, death, violence, tricksters and magicians. Quetzalcoatl represented light, Tezcatlipoca represented darkness. This does not mean that one was evil and the other good, instead they were both completely separate but necessary forces, representing essentially different elements of life. For instance, when it comes to Quetzalcoatl, his divine line leads to the, uh, the Toltec's powerful kingdom. The Aztecs also hoped that Quetzalcoatl would help them to, um, you know, their empire to grow big and strong. By the same token, however, 
It cannot be denied that the Aztecs were warriors by nature, and, well, Tezcatlipoca was the god of warriors. There is also no denying that Tezcatlipoca's use here, as he is the god of warriors and, and war, it's really not that hard to see how warriors and war can also make an empire big and strong. Therefore, although he had brought the Toltec civilization to its knees, he could also bring great fortune to those who followed him. Right, we've now arrived at the review section, and, well, to be honest, one positive was immediately apparent. The music was far better than this film's predecessor, the, the Aztec Mummy. This is not really saying much, of course, because, well, if I'm honest, anything would be better than that. The music here was really more just average, but it was still a 150% improvement. On top of that, though, the music isn't the only uh, sort of improvement in this one. The film was also lit a lot better than uh, than the Aztec Mummy. So in that film, in, in the Aztec Mummy, it was essentially so dark that even now I'm only about 50% sure how they defeated the Mummy at the end of the film. And at one or two points, it did lead to me feeling like, uh, well, I was just completely lost. Bear in mind, I was taking notes whilst watching that. If I was confused, I feel that most people would have been confused while watching that film. This is not an issue in this one at all. Not only is it lit very well, but it's also just incredibly easy to follow. Further to this, in the last film, the, the, the bats, you know, the, the evil gangster scientist who had, uh, basically he'd been masked the entire time. And when his identity was revealed, I had no idea who he was. Like it was just a, a massive anti-climax. In this one, they have a, a similar thing. Basically, there is a luchador mask wearing superhero. It is only at the end of the film that they reveal his identity, and they actually did a, de a, like a decent job of making you realise that this is the main character's cowardly assistant who's basically just been pretending to be a bit bumbling. It very much has a, a kind of like um, Clark Kent-esque feel to it, if you will. You know, like Superman Clark Kent. Moving on, likely because it was shot immediately after the, the, the last film, it serves as a direct continuation of the Aztec Mummy. So, for instance, the end of the last film sees the evil gangster scientist, I'm really not going to get over saying that, I love saying that, uh, the bats get arrested. And this film starts with him being taken off to jail and then being broken free by his gang. I actually really like this approach. It kind of made it feel like you were immediately diving back into a very silly world, and I really have no issue with that. Like, don't get me wrong, that approach doesn't work with every film ever made, but I do think it worked here. Further, the film does also seem to uh, continue the overall plot points as well, and does, does enough to make itself kind of like different to the first film to make it stand out. For instance, in the last film, they talk about the uh, hieroglyphs on the Aztec breastplate and, uh, and bracelet. They are sort of revealed to give the location of Aztec treasure, but they are never really sort of like translated at all. In this one, they actually do decipher the hieroglyphs, but then the notes get torn up at the end. It kind of feels like um, they're hinting at um, the treasure being found at the end of the, the last film of the series. Bearing in mind that the three films were all filmed at the same time, so I'm wondering if there's like an intentional overarching story here. Don't get me wrong, I could definitely be wrong here. After all, um, there's also very strong hints that these films aren't thought out at all. But you know, for now, that's my theory. On top of that, as well as a luchador wearing, you know, a luchador mask wearing superhero named the Angel, which I'm sorry, but that's just incredibly fun. Like, how can you not find that fun? They also take a slightly different approach to the mummy in this one. Where in the last film he was uh, attacking the good guy, you know, the good guys because they stole the uh, the breastplate plate from him. In this one, it is the bat and his henchmen who steal it. As a result, the mummy almost acts as a bit of a, an anti-hero of, of sorts, fighting, albeit unintentionally, alongside the good guys. 
again, I'm kind of wondering if he will just be a good guy in the next film. I kind of hope he does, because ultimately what? The next film is a robot versus an Aztec mummy. I feel like you could technically have either one of those as the good or the, the bad guy. Like, for instance, maybe it's the, an example of the bat builds the uh, the robot so that he can take down the Aztec mummy to get the breastplate and the uh, the bracelet. Oh my god. I bet that's it. I bet that's the story. Ah. We'll see, I guess. We'll see when I watch it. But anyway, anyway, moving on. Finally, at one part in the film, the, the angel is thrown into a room by gangsters. The floor then begins to open, revealing a snake pit beneath. Obviously, he, he does escape, which we shall get into later, because, well, honestly, that part of the film is hilarious. But the point I want to say here is that at the end of the film, we see the Aztec mummy throw the bat into this snake pit. I will admit, I laughed a lot at this point, but not entirely in a, uh, you know, so bad it's good way. I genuinely enjoyed that, and I felt it was it was very fitting for the film, you know, like it was the correct kind of tone. I actually thought it was a really fun way of ending the film, and it really, in a weird way, made me quite happy. But anyway, we've kind of covered the, uh, the purely good aspects of the film now, I feel. Let's move on to the parts that are kind of like unintentionally very charming and funny, but not necessarily for the right reasons. Well, as Hedzo said, unintentionally, I suppose. For a start, unsurprisingly, um, the acting in this one is just, just a tad wooden. But as I've said before, I tend to find there are two types of bad acting. Um, there's the, the type of bad acting which um, slowly grates on you over time, and then by the end it's just kind of unbearable. But then you also get the type that is just, you know, kind of funny and charming. And, well, this one definitely falls into the, the second vein here. It, it's funny and charming. Like, for instance, in, in um, one example, in one scene, if this is the one where our heroes first meet the luchador mask-wearing superhero, the Angel. They don't seem to view him as strange in the slightest, or they don't even find him funny either. They just kind of, like, greet him with very glum expressions. And I'm sorry, but... Well, imagine you are just walking through your house. Bear in mind, this is literally the example that we have in the film. You are just walking through your house when suddenly a large man wearing a luchador mask appears at the top of the stairs. I'm going to guess your first initial reaction here is, is going to be fear. Like, I'd say that's perfectly reasonable. A strange man is in your house. However, then slowly he swirls his cape around and tells you that he is here to save you from evil. I'd imagine you are either going to, you know, just tell him to get out at this point, or sort of just like nervously laugh, you know? <laughs> um, in the film they just kind of go, oh, you're a superhero, and, and that's it. Like, that's their reaction. <laughs> in fact, to be honest, I kind of love everything about the, the angel. He's just such a silly character, and I, I love the way people react to him. For example, right in one of the first scenes, there's like this prison bl uh, I can't speak. There's like this prison bus uh, driving off with, um, from the police station with the bat on it. The angel then drives up to the police station and asks for the directions as to where the bus is going. Then the police officers don't seem to find this weird masked man at all suspicious and just tell him exactly where the bus is going. Like they literally go, oh hello strange masked man. Yes, it's going that way, uh, just go west on the intersection. You know, like, it's so stupid. Bear in mind, that's the first time we see the angel, and it kind of seems as if he's, like, you know, like, not supposed to be known before this point. This isn't supposed to be a world where superheroes are just flying around, like in the MCU, for instance. As said earlier, uh, the gangsters at one point as well basically capture the angel and put him in a room where the floor is slowly parting to reveal a snake pit below. The angel jumps up and, and like, grabs onto the light, and then uses his, like, it's kind of like a walkie-talkie watch to call the son of the main character to come and rescue him. Honestly, right, this may be my favourite scene in the film, because, well, bear in mind, they are supposed to be in an incredibly rich and dangerous scientist-gangster's hideout. The child just kind of like 
wanders in and finds a hidden death room quite easily. But it doesn't even end there, because when he sees the angel hanging there... Okay, so you would think that the angel would just swing heroically back to safety. But no. He tells the child to pick up a plank of wood and start pushing him. So there is just this really awkward scene where the angel, this heroic superhero, is hanging there as a child basically just frauds him gently with a piece of wood. I was legitimately laughing really hard at this point. It was delightful for all of the wrong reasons. Like, honestly, there are a, you know, a few silly characters out there from various films that make me happy. You have Mothra from Godzilla, um, Jet Jaguar from Godzilla, Megalon from Godzilla, and now we have the Angel from this one. I love this character, and I would love to see more of him. I, I doubt that's ever going to happen, but, well, you know, I, I can hope. However, I will say he was not the only, uh, sort of, like, charmingly bad thing about this film. The Bat is also much more entertaining in this one, though pretty much for all of the wrong reasons, as, well, is highly unsurprising, I guess. For a start, once again, the good guys talk about how the, the Bat used to be a scientist who mismatched animals together to make terrifying creations. Quite an interesting story, all things considered. Now, for anyone who hasn't listened to my episode on the Aztec Mummy, you may probably think that this is a plot from that film. No. In that one, it's just vaguely mentioned, and in this one, they do exactly the same thing. They just vaguely mention it again. Like, this incredibly interesting idea that is not utilised in the slightest. I, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, but like, as bad as that is in, in terms of writing, it is undeniably quite hysterical as well. Like, how they've missed this really, really big thing they could put in the film. I mean, like, let, let, let's look at it quite logically, and I, I thought of this up in about 10 seconds while watching the film. All they needed to do was replace his henchmen in the film with these terrifying mismatched animals, and, you know, you work that little loose thread into the film. Like, I'm not going to say they have to be convincing. This is a cheap film, and I would definitely take, you know, like, cheap costumes of these monsters. In fact, to be honest with you, that would almost be more fitting for the film. But no, they, they just mention it and move on. Then, you know, uh, maybe maybe I'm being unfair here. Maybe it will be a big part of the uh, the last film in the series. You know, the robot versus the Aztec mummy. But in a weird way, I kind of hope it isn't because that would just be so much more funny. Like, that would be so, so great. Further, in this one, much like the uh, the last film, the Bat serves as a character who's mainly there just to introduce massive plot holes into the plot. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, this film takes place immediately after the last one. Yet whenever the Bat talks about the events of the last film, he always makes out that it happened ages ago. In this film's lore, it should have been a couple of weeks ago, Max. Like, realistically, probably not even that long. And even when it comes to the, you know, to real life, this film was released less than two months after the last one, so it doesn't even hold up when you look at things in real time. <laughs> then you get the fact that even the plot in this film makes no sense whatsoever. So basically, the Bat wants to get the breastplate and bracelet from the, uh, the Aztec mummy, which leads to Aztec treasure. First of all, I'm sorry, but that breastplate and that bracelet are probably pretty priceless as well. Like, you know, I don't really even see why you'd need to find the, uh, the, the treasure, but, well, you know, that's besides the point. Let's go along with this film's law. Um, so, right. To do this, he claims that he needs to get the main character's wife, Floor, so that he can hypnotise her to take her back to a past life. That way she can lead him to the treasure, because she was the one who kind of got, like, sacrificed there. But in the last film, well, firstly, Floor was already aware of where the treasure was, so why would she need to be hypnotised? I mean, they literally returned to the pyramid. But on top of that, the bat in the film even talks about how he saw them return, you know, return it back to the pyramid. So how come he doesn't know the location already? Further to that, in the, in the first film, they literally showed the bat watching our heroes go into the pyramids to get the breastplate. 
So, I mean, maybe I'm some kind of genius even greater than a scientist who can cause terrifying mismatched animals, but I'm going to make a guess here that the breastplate and bracelet may still be in the pyramid. Like, I, I, I'm, I, it boils the mind how they didn't see that plot hole. Now look, this obviously isn't a good element of the film, but I will admit it made me laugh a lot, so I kind of did enjoy it on some level. It was just so, so inept, I suppose is the only way of, of, um, of sort of like, um, calling it. Unfortunately, though, there were also some parts here that were just, you know, not very good, not even in a, like a, an a ironic kind of way. For a start, at least 10 minutes of the film was just a long recap of the last one, and then even when that had finished, they just continued to explain the last film. Bear in mind that this one is only, you know, like a smidge over an hour long. That means that essentially about one sixth of, the, of this whole film was recap. In a way, that is quite funny, don't get me wrong, but I, I do think it falls more into sort of like the realm of, of annoying. You know, it's not really very good. Finally, the middle of the film did drag a little bit. Um, it basically just consisted of the Angel and Dr. Eduardo getting captured by the villains, escaping, getting into a big fight, getting captured again, escaping, getting into a big fight, getting captured again, escaping, getting into a big fight, and well, you get the idea. Um, but either way, right, so that like, overall, although there were some positives here, such as the fact that both the music and lighting were far better than the first film, the fact that the, the film continues straight after the last one, and the mummy being used as a kind of anti-hero, there is still very little doubt that this film falls into the so bad it's good category. I mean, we have delightfully bad acting, a luchador superhero, the fact that a child can just wander into a gang's hideout without issue, and some glacier-sized plot holes. As such, as is the uh, kind of typical rule for this podcast, the highest this film can achieve is a 6 out of 10. Anything higher than that is really more reserved for films that are made, um, you know, that are good for the reason they were made. So, well, what do I give this one? Well, despite the fact that there were some, you know, there were definitely some negatives here, like long recaps of the last film and a very repetitive middle part that, well, definitely dragged, I still had an immense amount of fun watching this one. In fact, I looked over my podcast, and well, although there have been better films than this in the, you know, the recent past, the last film I had this much fun watching was actually Godzilla vs. Megalon, and that was months ago. Therefore, overall, despite this film's shortcomings, I can give it no less than six of 10. This is a very bad but very entertaining film and, well, in a very weird way, I do recommend it. If you want to watch it for yourself, I have put a link to the film in the description for the episode below. Thank you very much for joining me. I, I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. And well, if you have, you know the drill. Please do like, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, if much like the angel, you're a superhero and you've you you know you've just saved someone, they if they look at you with tears in their eyes and go, how how could I ever repay you? You could say to them, well now there is a subject out there that needs your help, Egyptology. And boy, do I have a podcast for you, the Mummy Movie Podcast. And they will go, whoa, me, an egyptologist? That would be so cool. And you would say, yes, it is vital that people show an interest in such subjects. Without interest, even such cool and remarkable subjects like Egyptology will eventually vanish. Therefore, by supporting these subjects, you can be a hero just like me, kiddo. And then, skip forward 20 years, that bright-eyed young child is now a world-renowned Egyptologist and has garnered heaps of interest in the subject. They are having an interview when they are asked what got them into Egyptology. They will smile slightly and let out a small laugh. <laughs> 
And they will answer, well now, that is a story that goes back many years. But it started with a great superhero who gave me some great advice to listen to the Mummy Movie Podcast. And then the interview will go, the Mummy Movie Podcast? And the great Egyptologist will reply, the Mummy Movie Podcast. And the interviewer will go, well, I shall have to listen to this Mummy Movie Podcast. And the Egyptologist will go, well, to be honest, it's a bit rubbish now. He ran out of uh, Mummy Movies about 10 years ago and just kind of uh, doesn't know when to stop. But, you know, the, the first 500 episodes were, are worth listening to. And then I will be at home in my rocking chair, my head now shiny and chrome, I mean, I mean bald, when my hologrammatic receiver will start buzzing. I shall look at their notifications, cast in the three-dimensional vortex around me, as people begin to listen again. A singular tear will leak from the corner of my eye. As I stare out of the window, there is a luchador mask-wearing superhero. I shall squint, my eyes not quite as good as they used to be, but I swear I can see a small smile and a nod. And then just like that, you, the superhero, shall jump off into the night, knowing that you have not just saved my podcast, you have saved the very field of Egyptology itself. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that one got away from me that definitely got away from me there. Um, anyway, please do join me next time where we shall be looking at the secret of the mummy from 1982. I hope you all have an excellent next couple of weeks and see you then.